You're a designer at the forefront of a brand new entertainment medium. Something that blends multiple creative disciplines and packs it with the latest bleeding edge technology. How do you present it? What image do you flash in front of the consumer to communicate what you're about? Well, uh, in 1972, they were still figuring that out. To be honest, I'm not sure how I would answer that question myself. The gaming medium and the home console market were still a primordial soup with things like an audience, standards, and hardware yet to solidify. In that sense, the very first console, the Magnavox Odyssey, is a perfect symbol of its era. You take one look at this thing and you have no idea what it is or what it does. The second generation of consoles would see a lot more experimentation. Maybe a console is a cassette player. Maybe it's a phone? Maybe it's a box with lines. I think it's funny that despite all of these taking such radically different approaches, they keep the stylistic trappings of their decade. Look at the Atari 2600, it's literally wood paneled. Then, as with many things, Nintendo changed the game. The Famicom had been a moderate success in its home country of Japan, and they were looking to expand into the US market. This came with a number of hurdles, uh, mostly a result of Atari. See, after the big A pulled out of the console business without warning to focus on home computers, they burned retailers pretty badly. Consumers were also left confused and soured on the home gaming trend. Nintendo had to prove that their system was different. And that meant a rebrand for the states. Cue the Nintendo Entertainment System. It's a space age VCR. That's not even my words, it was literally designed after them as they were popular in the US at the time. Instead of the matte black or shiny silver that you'd find on those devices, the NES was off-white, dark gray, and black with splashes of red. It looks like it came from the moon. The controller didn't use a joystick, but a D-pad. To drill in the futuristic aesthetic, it came with a robot buddy. This was around the time of Japan's infamous bubble economy, when they were making huge strides in technology and innovation. They wanted you, slobbering American, to know that these Japanese were coming with the next wave. Also, it has a gun. Because Americans like guns. All these decisions and more were made very intentionally to distinguish themselves from Atari. Atari said their console wasn't a toy? Well, ours is. People were just calling it the Atari? Let's throw another word into our name, entertainment. Because it's a new form of entertainment. This strategy was so successful that the NES sold over twice as many units in the US as they did Japan, carving out an unstoppable lead in the console market. Until a few years later, that is. If the NES was a space shuttle, the Genesis was a stealth jet. So what's blast processing do? Sega's prior console, the Master System, looked kind of like the base of a coffee maker, and the SG-1000, which it was based on, was a little too... Uh, Fisher-Price? If Sega was going to compete with Nintendo, they needed to blow them out of the water in tech and aesthetics. They went back to the drawing board. The Master System and NES were deemed too toy-like in appearance. Much like Nintendo worked to distance themselves from Atari, Sega needed their own visual identity, so they looked to high-end audio equipment and performance cars for inspiration all black with a touch of maroon and either gold or white depending on the region. It's darker, edgier. You can see their influences in little touches like the grill that resembles a speaker or a heat vent, the volume slider like you'd find on an audio mixer. The NES controllers were rectangular bricks so the Genesis went with a round, sleek design meant to fit more comfortably in the hands. 
I think the second Genesis model is my favorite. It really captures that minimal aerodynamic look that I think of when I picture the system. This boldness, grabbing their target audience by the collar and hauling them along for the ride, is what let Sega steal away 60% of Nintendo's market share in the 90s. In response to this, Nintendo doubled down. If the NES was toy-like, the Super Nintendo was even more so. I'm a big fan of the SNES's look, actually. I find the color palette really pleasing to the eye. That same off-white, now matched with gray, purple, and lilac. Everything about it is softer and friendlier. All the corners are rounded out. The buttons or weird sliding things have a gentle concave to them, no sharp edges to be found. Even the choice to make purple the key color, a shade in between red and blue, not too cool, not too hot. This is a design that's confident in their identity. The SNES proved successful, but this time, Sega didn't have a response ready. The Saturn is an oft-forgotten part of gaming history, some would say overlooked, and I don't think its visual design does it any favors. In many ways, it looks like a bulkier Genesis. If the NES was based on a VCR, this was a VCR. It doesn't really excite as much as it makes you go, Oh, is that like a, a new Genesis? Huh. Uh, well, it looks like a Sega console, I suppose. I think that's pretty funny considering only two months later, Sony would crack open the entire industry with the PlayStation. On the surface, this is a very minimalist design, but it's kind of perfect for the system. The greatest strength of the PlayStation, in my opinion, was that it was a console for everyone. Kids, teens, and adults all had options no matter what genre you liked. Where Nintendo was leaning more family-friendly and Sega more edgy, PlayStation was a blank slate. And that's what I get out of the PS1 design. Simple. All gray. Not too angular, not too round. Straight lines form the shape of the box, while circles draw your eye to the centers of attention. You click a button and the center pops open to reveal the disc tray. Oh, I get it. Wonderful, timeless design. By contrast, Nintendo was experimenting. The N64 had a rocky development history. Originally being a disc-based system before reverting to cartridges, I wonder how many different looks it went through. Instead of the light, friendly colors of the SNES, the N64 is all matte black, strangely minimal, while also looking blobby with its big hill in the center. The controller is also this weird looking device. Maybe some of it was an intentional part of the aesthetic, but it's also a victim of not knowing what to do with analog sticks yet. Sega's last hurrah in the console space would be a memorable one. Finally, they would break out of their comfort zone. The Dreamcast was all white. The logo, an orange spiral, the box itself has this cool circle and triangle motif going on. It feels like they were done with their edgy phase and were ready to be much more playful and mysterious. Even the controller is silly looking. That's a great way to sum up a console known for burning bright and burning out. It had tons of unique, interesting games that ensured its legacy would long outlive its short life. I think the PS2 is the best looking console ever. It takes the minimal design of the PS1 and turns it into a bold statement, this towering obelisk that just says PS2 in a font that matches the vibe of the console. It looks like nothing else, based around sleek, parallel lines. It works from any angle, horizontal or vertical. I especially love it standing up, it looks like a skyscraper. The PS2 era would see a lot of games, especially Japanese ones, take on this burgeoning aesthetic of thin lines and digital interfaces. There's something very dark and cyberpunk about it, the blurring of lines between technology and us and this look captures the feeling of that era so effortlessly. While the PS2 would go on to be the best-selling console of all time, that didn't mean there wasn't competition, and the sixth generation was a period of great changes. For one, 
Nintendo's offering after the faltering sales of the N64. The GameCube is an enigma. In many ways, it feels like Nintendo was playing it safe. Revert to the purple and gray of the SNES. It's just a box. No frills, no nothing. Oh yeah. Everything about the GameCube is so unadventurous. And then this bizarre lunchbox handle is there. It serves no hardware function. There's nothing hidden in there. It's just a handle meant to make the thing easier to pick up and carry around. Or use as a bludgeoning weapon. It gives it a kind of childish look. I'm not sure that's what they were going for, but that image became a kind of shackle around Nintendo's neck for a while. Hey, take a look at the GameCube logo. So there's obviously a cube here, but did you notice that it hides a G? Very observant, but check this out. There's a C in there too! It's the initials, they're in the logo! Even the controller is this weird thing, what were they doing in there? After the N64's market failure, I get the impression Nintendo wanted to do something radically different, and the GameCube was the first attempt at that. It's so minimal, but that handle adds this WTF factor. This generation would see another company making their first foray into home consoles. It's the Xbox, baby! It's a big fucking American console, packed with 733 freedom hertz of CPU power! The controller is Big Mac size. Tiny Japanese people can't even hold it in their tiny Asian hands. My hands look like this. Microsoft wanted to make a statement with the Xbox. This was the first major American console since... The, the 3DO? Wow. The design is so audacious and stupid. I love it. Someone in marketing said, uh, put a big X on it. I'm a big fan of the black and green color scheme. It gives it an alien vibe, like it's some sort of experimental technology. And I do legitimately like this big silly X built into the chassis. When you look at it from overhead, they were really leaning into the symmetry of the branding. It almost looks like it could be a logo itself. Their follow-up, the 360, is a much sleeker, more refined version of the original. Instead of literally building a giant letter into the shape, it's got a curve that creates a subtle X no matter what angle you see it from. It's very much of its time in that mid-2000s Frutiger Arrow kinda style, but I think it holds up. It still looks dynamic all these years later. The name 360 was chosen because they wanted it to be a portal to another world. I think the power button really nails that with this chrome finish and lights. The console itself was designed to look like it was a restraining device for some kind of powerful force. By contrast, I'm not as into the PS3's original design. It looks like an obese PS2. It's even called the fat model. Oddly enough, the first thing designed for it was the logo. PlayStation president Ken Kutaragi insisted that they use the same font from Sony's Spider-Man movies, and the round, contoured look of the lettering informed the design of the console itself. It just looks better when it's wrapped around something. Still, this design is pretty fitting for the launch PS3. Like, if I showed you this and told you, yeah, this was an overpriced bloated system that was way too confident in itself, I think you'd nod your head. The slim model is a lot more appealing to me, just sleeker and lighter. Not my favorite of all time, but better than the original. While Sony and Microsoft were presenting the world with their own interpretations of what power is, Nintendo was focusing on something different. They decided, after the GameCube's own poor sales, to embrace a different market and go back to their roots. We would like to play. The Wii doesn't emanate raw power. It isn't obviously bold in the way the GameCube was. Instead, it's a simple white box. It's approachable, understandable. The controller is like a TV remote. It's made to be accessible and intuitive, first and foremost. That straightforward branding became Nintendo's greatest strength. Their competitors were fighting over a specific, more hardcore demographic, so they focused on getting games into places they never would have been before. In that way, 
The Wii's neutral colors let it fit into any situation. It never looks out of place. The Wii dominated the charts throughout the entire 7th gen. It was a race for second place if you weren't Nintendo. And then... Uh... Wii U. Okay. If you didn't own one, and without me showing it on screen, can you picture what the Wii U looks like? Not the controller, the console itself. Okay, I'll give you a second. Pop, here it is. As a follow-up, the Wii U represents Nintendo's struggle to innovate after their breakout success. Just look at it, it's practically identical, but without those little touches that set its predecessor apart. The angular corner and jutting buttons that gave it depth. It looks kind of like a bootleg console to be honest. The console itself is kind of huge. It's almost a foot long and it weighs about three and a half pounds. Uh, it's glossy and it picks up fingerprints like crazy. It's just kind of ugly, but fortunately you can hide it in the stack by your TV and never really pay attention to it. The controller was the most visually striking part of the system and it took center stage in all of its marketing. To be fair, it's certainly interesting, but also gimmicky. Like you took a pro controller and wedged a big screen in the middle. It felt like Nintendo was trying to figure out where to go next, and couldn't come up with anything as brilliant as the Wii. They'd languish for a few years, while much stronger competition thrived. From an aesthetic point of view, I like the PS4 a lot. After the PS3's tumultuous sales history, Sony went back to the PS2 school of design and focused on making a simple slab based on clean, parallel, and perpendicular lines. The stacked slope look is simple and memorable. I like the subtle integration of touch-sensitive buttons and the way the discs slide into the gap. It just makes it feel like a piece of sci-fi technology where its inner workings are obscure. Just a really nice showing from their designers, and it matches the console's role as the one that got them back on top with a simpler, easy to design for a philosophy that the PS3 lacked. It wasn't just the PlayStation 4's successes that earned them their spot, but also the Xbox One's failures. Its visual design wasn't among them, I just didn't know how else to transition into talking about this disaster of a console. It's not a terrible design, it's like a chunkier 360, taking out the curves. Microsoft wanted this to be the all-in-one entertainment console, and it matches that by being... kind of... nondescript. I just don't have much to say about it. One of the more interesting aspects is the segmented panels of the case, which were meant to evoke Microsoft's Metro interface style they were using across all their devices at the time. I don't know, there's this video they did with GameSpot about the design process, and there was an incredible amount of work put into a look that just doesn't do much for me. After the roaring success of the PS4, the 5 is like a symbol of Sony's hubris. It looks like it has a popped collar, for God's sake. I'm gonna be honest, I think the PS5 might be my least favorite design of any console. I don't like the collar, I don't like the weird asymmetrical curve, I don't like that the center band feels like it's too short, it, it's just uncomfortable to look at for me. The longer I stare at it, the more things I find wrong. There's an interview with its designer, Yuji Morisawa, where he says he was trying to sculpt the invisible mass in between the player and the mechanical engineering. What? I came up with the term five dimensions. When thinking about the experience we have, it's kind of, you are living in a parallel world or you're jumping around time or space. This is the PlayStation 5, so five dimensions really fits. Uh, okay? I will say I can see some interesting ideas here. There's an attempt to blend synthetic and organic. It has these curves and round corners, but it's in a sort of mechanical black and white material. The filling, for lack of a better term, is flanked by vents that remind me of gills, and when it glows, it feels like the system's about to breathe. Definitely going out on a limb, but not for me. After the complete floundering that was the X-Bone, I get the sense that Microsoft wasn't as down with the Xbox division, 
or keeping up a fight in the insanity that is the video game industry. Compare this to the growth of the PC gaming space, which they basically own. Is it a surprise then that the Series X looks like a PC tower? When this design was initially revealed, a few people joked about it looking like a trash can, and it does, but like, what else is there to compare it to? It's so featureless I often forget what it even looks like just because I don't own one. If there's one neat thing about it, it's the grill on top. It's definitely the most memorable part of the design, and the only curved part of the entire box. They put this concave green plastic thing underneath, and it creates this cool perspective effect. It's such a high contrast from the black of the rest of the thing that it almost glows. I like it. I do like the Series S more, just for the fact that it looks weirder like a turntable or something. It reminds me of the Odyssey with the what am I even looking at factor. This is an intentional part of the design, you see, as the team's goal was, quote, literally and visually quiet. The Series X and especially S were built to fit into any situation and any room. It might have been a little too good at that. Before the official reveal of the Series S, Phil Spencer did an interview where there was one just sitting in the background of his office, and no one could tell. It's here, by the way. Did you notice that? It, it was there the whole time. I get what they're going for, but I have to wonder if it's a good thing. It feels like they're trying to pretty up the slow, whimpering death of the Xbox division. In lighter news, did you know about Nintendo Switch? I saved this one for last because I think it's my favorite of the 9th gen systems visually. There's a kind of brilliance to it. Hey, everybody thought the Wii U controller was the console. So why don't we just make it the console? What was once confusing for the consumer is now the most intuitive part of the system. The input method is the controller. The Joy-Cons remind me of the DS as well. Plain, but with lots of room to customize with unique colors. The dock? Just set it in and it connects to the TV. Take it out and use it at school, on the bus, at jury duty, and it works. It's elegant in the same way the Wii was. Intuitive, simple, yet unlike anything else in its space. It's also the first example in this video of a system whose design and function are so intertwined. There couldn't be a more perfect look to symbolize Nintendo's return to form. What do you think? What's your favorite console design of all time? I had to skip a lot of regional models and more minor systems in the interest of time, so let me know if there's any designs you love that I missed. Before I go, I wanted to let you guys know that the other day some absolute nutjob came into my comment section and I provoked him into having a meltdown, during which he left a comment that included Hashtag never going to hit 10k and hashtag get an actual job. I promise you that if I do hit 10,000 subscribers, I will dedicate that video to reading through his screed because it is truly one of the funniest, weirdest things anyone has ever written to me. Check out my podcast and thanks to my patrons who keep this channel free. Here comes the daredevil! Game over! Over.